morning, everybody. Wow, I must have preached so good the last time it took me three years to get back. So, I hope I don't preach as good this time so you can come back next year, maybe. God bless you all. It's so good to be back here. It just felt like forever and like it wasn't going to get back. But uh, I'm just so thankful for overcoming by faith to say this is home. Could you clap for me and Sandra? This is home. Praise the Lord. Stand up, Sandra. There's my sweetie girl right there. Take her around with me because she makes me look kind of good. People wonder, how in the world did he? Don't worry about it. Don't worry how I got her. Don't even worry about it. Praise the Lord. Wow. Uh, I'm happy that Pastor Rick has an opportunity to... Uh, take some time away. I hear there's a grandbaby coming, and um, I would be down there too, you know. There's another little girl, I think they say, is coming, and uh, so God bless uh, Ricky and his uh, lady, and, and just God bless everybody. It's Christmas season, isn't it? Time for good and forgiving, and I got to do something that will help me out right here. Oh, my goodness. You know, I figured I'd do a fusion today of um, the Christmas story and the parable that Jesus gave. He came here to give understanding and an opening of our minds to what the kingdom of God is like. He told probably 36 or more parables. He would not teach anything unless he gave a parable. And within the parable is meaning that, that will unlock our understanding of what the kingdom of God is really, really like. And the truth is, I saw one parable, but actually that would be parallel perfectly with Christmas time, oddly enough. Let's pray and we'll get into it. Father, I thank you for this opportunity, for the people in this building, in all the hundreds, maybe a thousand or so online, who can be here today to worship you in spirit and in truth. We glorify you. We don't, uh, uh, we don't begrudge people who decide that they don't want to set aside a day to celebrate your birth, Jesus. But we don't let anyone else begrudge us and get away with it when we decide to do so. How much more important event than the birth of the Savior of the entire world. We glorify you, celebrate you, and we know that your kingdom started so small, small as the seed inside of a, a young girl's womb, and spans the world. We thank you. We honor you for the unstoppable seed of God in Jesus' name. Could you clap your hands and say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. You know, many, many uh, may have seen the connection between the parable of the mustard seed, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, actually the mustard tree, mustard seed and mustard tree, and the plan of God as he sent Jesus to this world. He sent him to, as I mentioned in the prayer, into the womb of Mary. That had to be a shocking thing for her. Nothing like this had ever been heard of over the, the whole existence of mankind on earth. How how dare I think that I heard from God that God is going to be inside of here. And for us today, we think of it and we, we celebrate the miracle, but we know that the same miracle has occurred inside of most everybody in this building. God lives inside of here. Say amen. amen. And so his impact from that moment that little bitty town called Nazareth, where he was conceived, has changed the entire globe. 
the entire universe, all of creation. And every time I think about it long enough, it completely blows me away. The extent to which God went to save you, to save my crazy self, to pull us out of eternal damnation. See, we, we get so casual about it, we forget that this is big stuff. This is earth-shattering stuff. This is eternity-changing stuff. You get to be with God forever because God humbled himself down. That's why we celebrate the coming of Jesus into the womb of this woman and being born on this world. Doesn't matter which day of the year. Y'all don't know what day I was born, but here I am. <laughs> you know, the important thing is that I'm here and that you're here. I want to look at the book of Mark, chapter 4. I'll read three verses, verses 30 through 32. It says, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain, say grain, grain. like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Remember that. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade, all from a tiny seed. Interesting. What does that got to do with Christmas? Just wait on me a minute. I ain't going to be long. In this parable, Jesus wanted it to be known that the kingdom of God's beginnings on earth was so small. He really tried to get it across. He talked about it a lot. He talked about some yeast that you put in, in, in dough, un, almost unseen stuff. Put it in dough and boom, the whole thing becomes it, you know? Uh, you plant a seed 30, 60, 100 fold. He's trying to tell us, Stop looking for the spectacular. Jesus has snuck into your life already. And he's at work right now on something you think is impossible. That very thing you think to be impossible is never going to work out. He's working in that right now. It doesn't matter what you feel. He's not impressed with your feelings. He feels with you, but he's not impressed with them. He's already planted that grain of mustard seed inside of you. You can't stop it. I'm going to show you that you can't stop it in just a few minutes. It's going to take over the whole world. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, his conception in, in Mary's womb. And he came to that nasty little town. You know, Nazareth wasn't really a clean. It wouldn't win all America city. It would not. It's not some place you go to. It's all like Columbia. You don't go there for tourism. You come to Savannah if you want a tour. You know, you, Columbia's on the way to somewhere, all right? I love Columbia. I think it's beautiful. It's my home now, you know? Been there for 29 years. Can y'all believe that? I know I don't look like it, but it, I, I mean, it just, it's my, it, it feels like me. That's what God has transplanted, Sandra, in me. But you don't go there to tour the city. Nazareth was somewhere kind of, okay, well, you got to go through, go through there to get where you're going. And they say it was a smelly little town. You know, its only claim to fame was that it was up on a cliff or something. Tried to push Jesus off that cliff one day. He walked right through the crowd. Can't get him unless he decides for you to get him. See? This little girl in this little town, in this little country, in this little part of the world, on this little planet, in this little solar system, in this little galaxy, in this little, well, big universe, he decides he's going to jump off everything right there. 
and put an invisible seed inside of a woman's womb without the agency of a man. People of his day didn't really grasp what God was up to in the world. The very same people who had gotten the word of God, the covenants of God, the plan of God. They were the people of God who were separated. Abraham was pulled apart and a family came out of him and he's going to bless the whole world through him. They didn't get it. If Israel didn't get it, you know the world wasn't going to get it. Your DNA was flung somewhere across the world. I kind of see where most of y'all are from. <laughs> and we had no idea. The Bible says we were the people who were not. That's, that's about the biggest insult you can ever give anybody. You are somebody who is not. God called us to people who were not. The people of God, Israel, were the people who were, but they, they didn't catch the plan. And they were supposed to be the people who revealed the plan. We're in trouble. Yet he chose this little town, this little lady, and this little plan. The very men and women of God who were supposed to know God looked straight at him. He had neon lights blinking all over him, and they didn't see who he was. Sweet little Jesus boy, born in a lowly manger. Remember that? We didn't know who you was. Didn't know you come to save us, Lord. Didn't know you come to set us free. Treated you mean, Lord. Treat me mean, too. They didn't know who you was. God was up to something real big. But when God is up to something real big, he starts real small. He doesn't start big. Start small. You think you're small today? You're a candidate for big. I am not the one who's supposed to be up here doing this. I am absolutely not. Yeah, my daddy was big, yeah, big time dude. And yo, know, he was, he didn't know about that Gregory. Just didn't know about that Greg. <laughs> Everybody else was like, boom, Sylvester, some of y'all know him. Boom, he's out there. And the rest of them, you know, boom, Greg, okay, he'll be a nice guy. He'll probably have a nice little job. God had a ministry inside of me from the day, before, the day I was conceived, and I didn't even know it. But he starts things out like that, insignificant, scared of yourself, don't want to be seen. You know what he'll do to you in time? Blink your eyes. Blink your eyes. And you're standing in front of thousands of people to unfold the mystery. Jesus shared a parable to give us a clue in how the kingdom of God begins in insignificance. It's one day is going to achieve worldwide dominance. You know, there's a kingdom. The whole world is going to be God's kingdom. Do you understand that? Not going to be one person who disagrees. The thousand year millennium. It's coming, y'all. Sorrow over people who die, but don't like, be like people who don't have hope. Because this is just the beginning of the beginning. And your death is the beginning of the fulfillment of everything that God ever planned for you. You think it's over and that you're missing out on something? Are you kidding me? God has got something so huge, he can't even put it in your mind. Eyes haven't seen it. Ears haven't heard it. Let's talk about the kingdom's insignificance, that little seed. The Lord had, the Lord had a choice of using any growing thing in Israel. You understand that? He's God. He could have chosen anything to compare the kingdom to. He could have chosen the mighty cedar of Lebanon. You know what I'm saying? Could have chosen the beautiful rose. He could have chosen something amazing. You don't realize it yet, but you will that he, what, what, why do you pick mustard? I'm, I'm supposed to be impressed, Jesus. This is how the people felt when he says, what shall I compare the kingdom to? Hmm. And he had everything at his disposal that had been created that lives. And he picked a mustard tree. You don't understand, but you will. Why, why would you do that? He could have chosen anything. 
But he chose to convey the power of the kingdom of God, its process, its power, its potential. She was a little seed from a mustard tree, bush. Look at Mark chapter 4, verses 30 and 31. And he said, with what shall we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, a grain, one grain, one seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Hmm. Notice the kingdom of God is compared not to many seeds, but to one. Not only is there one seed, but it's also the smallest of them all. There are those who get tripped up by the description of the mustard seed as being the smallest of all seeds. See, it's a pretty smart, you know, people got some little noggin. Some people so smart, my mama used to say that, boy, you're so smart, you're dumb. <laughs> I didn't like that when she said that. <laughs> but I couldn't do nothing about it. She was the mama. I come up with some... Some, some dumb thoughts every once in a while. You're so smart. She said all seven of us. Oh, you're so smart, you're dumb. Um, some little smarty pants, scientists, kind of botanists kind of people, they, they realize that that is inaccurate. Jesus said the mustard seed was the smallest seed on earth. The scientists, and especially those who are atheistic in this world, says, Here's just one little statement he made that discredits the whole word of God. Because we have found seeds far smaller than a mustard seed. Now, if Jesus was any kind of God, he should have known that there were smaller seeds in the world than a mustard seed. Now, if that doesn't mess with you, it certainly messes with me. Because he in the Bible, and the Bible can't lie, unless the Bible is a lie. Said it was the smallest. You read that, you heard it, didn't you? The smallest of all seeds on earth. I'll tell you what you start doing. You start thinking, well, maybe in town, maybe you're talking about, no, he said on the whole world. We got to fix that. And I'll fix it the next time I come. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. He said it was the smallest seed of them all, all seeds in the world. Either that's the truth or it's a lie. We know it can't be true physically because people have found seeds much smaller. There are big old uh, cedar trees over there whose seeds, believe it or not, are smaller than a mustard seed. Could have picked that. Why didn't he pick that, a majestic tree like that? There are lilies over there. The seeds are smaller. And Jesus knew it. He had to know it. Well, smaller than a mustard seed. Why did he say that? He had to know he made the thing. I'm not tripped up by that at all. The Greek word for smallest is the word called, it's, it's I'll pronounce it in our parlance, microteron. It's, I think it's microteron. Micro, small, I don't know what the Terran part means. Maybe it means ist, <laughs> small ist. Micro Terran is the word used in the Greek, if you look it up, you know, that corresponds with smallest. According to those linguists, it is more accurately, though, guess what? Translated least, less than, which is different from smallest in size. It has to do with insignificance. It has to do with who cares. I don't want that around me. He came unto his own, and they received him not. We looked on him. He had no form of comeliness that we should desire him. It was the least. He was the least. He was not picking on size, even though this, this plant was so, this seed was so small. He was not. He was not focusing on the actual physical size as much as he was focusing on the insignificance of a mustard seed. I'm going to show you why. (sighs) 
let's talk about how dominant something that small can get. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 32. Yet, yet, it's the smallest of all seeds in the world, yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Okay, that's fairly impressive, but I'm still not as impressed. I've seen these big old trees out there. Okay, well, it's small, it becomes, okay, it's birds. Wow, your kingdom is amazing, Jesus. Yeah. You could have picked anything. He, he stood there a while and he said, to what? Listen, he thought about it. To what shall we compare the kingdom? That means he had time to consider and think and pray about it. He picked a mustard seed. Some interesting facts about mustard trees. You ready? First of all, <laughs> it's not anything impressive. All right, mustard's mustard. All right, you put it on your hot dog. Gotcha. A little bitter taste to it, but that's about as much as you can kind of do with it. You know, you don't like mustard, mustard on your hot dog? Oh, some people French. don't. French, French, is, French is mustard. Yeah, Grey Poupon for me, please. <laughs> it is considered, actually, the mustard tree is actually not considered something fancy. You don't take it and put it in your house. Don't bring it to your girlfriend, brothers, okay? <laughs> It is considered a weed. Why is Jesus talking about a weed? It can grow tall. Yeah, about four feet taller than me. Okay, that's okay, Lord. Eight to ten feet tall. Nearly impossible to cut it down. You know that? To get rid of it? Do you realize that a mustard seed, once it grows into a bush in the garden, it could get that tall, but what you don't see is what's growing under that ground. You see 10 feet tall mustard tree. Do you know that below the ground is 10 feet deep of roots? It is as, the roots are as big as the, the leaves. It's huge and it's Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of little roots going down in the ground. You cut it down, you've made the biggest mistake of your life. Because when you cut it down, something starts happening under the ground. You cut it down, a signal gets sent all the way down to every little piece of the roots. And every one of the roots begins to send up little tendrils. And it comes up. And before you know it, there's thousands of them all over the place. Y'all hearing where I'm going? Some of y'all are a little ahead of me. You got me. We're starting to see why Jesus picked the mustard tree. If you don't want your garden to be completely taken over by mustard, do not cut that tree down. Because it will take over and it will choke out everything in your garden. No matter what you built in there, I don't care what you got, your nice little lilies, your little roses, your little gladiolas. They're going down, baby. It's going to choke you out if you cut it down, I tell you, if you cut it down. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat fall to the earth and die, it will abide alone. But if you kill it, if you bury it, it's going to come up and bear much fruit. Do you understand the mistake that the devil made, first of all, in, in not figuring out what was happening over there in Nazareth and not being able to kill him? The problem was he was stuck either way. Y'all understand that? You leave Jesus alive, he's still going to take over the world. The problem is, if he does, you can't get saved. So he's got to hide the plan. 
That's why a lot of people in this world don't understand the plan. It's hidden. But those who want it will find it. Have you found him? Raise your hand if you found him. Wave him back and forth. Wave him. You found him. You found him. Clap your hands if you found him. You started looking for him. If you don't want to find Jesus, he is nice enough not to ever show himself to you. And if you want him, I don't care how confused you are. I was one of those confused people. No matter how con you could not have been more confused than me. Ask my wife. <laughs> Raise your hand, sister. Could not, am I right about it? Could not have been more confused. I was scared under death some of that craziness I was talking about. In the midst of my confusion, 23 Franklin Square, First African Baptist Church, April the 9th, 1978. Never forget it. About 1.15 in the afternoon. That's when the pastor always finishes his message. I was listening to this Jesus guy because I just, I kind of looked up and said, if you're there. No, I said, I know you're there. I couldn't understand why I knew it, but I just know you, I know. And if you can help me, if you can help me, I was confused, y'all. If you can help, I know you're there and I know you're perfect. That's all I know. That's all I know. That's all I know. If you can help me, help me. This was going on inside of me. I was quiet on the outside, but I was screaming on the inside. If you could help me. Pastor said something about joining the church. I didn't know what he was talking about. I just walked up in front, just started trembling and crying. If you want him, he will find you. He will find you. You can't get rid of it now. Ah, Christianity. From that one little seed has grown across this globe to where there are over two and a half billion of us. You understand, if we get ourselves halfway together, if each one of us got our halfway together over the next year and said, I'm going to win one somebody. You know that doubles in a year. See how the kingdom of God works? Very small. to are taking over the whole world. Oh, all that explosion came. Because one little rabbi from a tiny village called Nazareth, right, nearly 2,000 years and eight time zones away, started out in the ministry with 12 unlikely men. Shaking up the whole world. Why we celebrate Christmas? Are you kidding me? The reach of the gospel is all over the place. We're doing it again now. You're sharing in that right now. As you participate and you pray and you give and you listen and you share. The plan of God is being fulfilled as we speak. And I'm thankful that I'm a part of it. Are you thankful you're a part of that? Yeah. Clap your hands. That's what I'm a part of. Let's pray about it. Father God, we understand that once the kingdom of God gets a foothold in our lives, we can be prepared for it to take over everything in our lives. Take charge, Jesus. We belong to you. You deserve it by the choice you made to humble yourself, even unto death on a cross. Now you are highly exalted, and you have a name above every name, that at your name, every knee will bow. And your kingdom will take over our lives in the most impressive way possible. Thank you for coming in, Jesus. Thank you for coming to our world. In your name, Jesus, we give you praise and honor. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There is still room at the cross for you. 
heads are bowed for a second. If there's anybody here, if you're not convinced yet, you'll get convinced later. But if you're convinced now, it didn't take long for me to ask you. You don't have him living in your heart right now. You haven't repented of your, the way you thought about God, about the world. You've listened to so many other voices, but now you feel a conviction from God. If that's you, friend. I'd love to see that you designate that that is so and that you want to receive this Jesus, this Son of God, simply by the lifting up your hand, up your hand, just raise it high so I can see it. If you're online and you're saying, yeah, I want Jesus, the Son of God, to change my life, to make me new, there's a feature, I am told, on your site, on your page, a raise your hand feature. If you do that, I think it's called I Raise My Hand. Just do that. And I'm sure there's information here for us. You can call, receive help and prayer. If you choose to do that, I'm so thankful and grateful that you will make Jesus Christ king of your life, the king in your world. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless. Clap your hands. Give God praise.